What's up, everybody, and welcome to a special mini episode of the OU Insider Under the Visor podcast. Obviously, this is a departure uh, from our typical release schedule, but with good reason because we got a special guest tonight. Uh, my name is Parker Thune. I am flying solo. You're traditionally used to Brandon Drum being alongside me here. Uh, but tonight is his 10 year anniversary with his wife. So congratulations to them. He also just turned, he also had a birthday yesterday. Uh, so uh, lots of celebrations this week for him. Uh, but that is the reason why it's just going to be me tonight. As I mentioned, though, special guest. And for those of you uh, that are casual Sooner fans, you probably know him as DTY. For those of you that are diehards, you probably know him as Trouble. And if you're a film junkie, you might simply know him as 32. But one way or another, <laughs> if you're a regular listener of this podcast, no doubt over the last year and a half or so, uh, you have heard me rave about how this dude was one of the most underrated players on the entire roster uh, during his time at Oklahoma and is now preparing to take his talents to the professional level. Joined now by Delarian Turner Yell. And Trey, man, I appreciate you taking this time. Uh, how's everything been going for you over the last few months? Obviously, your final game as a Sooner was that Alamo Bowl victory over Oregon. But uh, just kind of walk us through what the journey has been for you since December. Right. Uh, so started from starting off from December, man, it also it, it kind of started rough because um, I think like right after the game, we like entered New Year's or whatever. And so I was supposed to go to Florida like within the next like three to four days after the game. But I get home, um, start to celebrate New Year's and whatnot, and I end up testing positive for COVID. And so um, just starting off, it was kind of like, whoa, like what's going on now? Because it ended up pushing um, my my time to get down to Florida to, you know, start training for the, for the combine, end up pushing it back like two weeks. And so... Uh, I started to like get into panic mode, like what am I gonna do now? Things like that, and and this time, you know, when I did test positive, it was kind of like one of those where I'm in the bed the entire time, like really didn't have the energy to do anything. So um, I ended up getting over that, and then once I did get down to Florida, um, I ended up uh, dealing with the hamstring again, um, same hamstring that that I, I dealt with uh, during the season, and so that kind of had me off to a slow start, and I'm like you know, what can possibly be going wrong right now. And so uh, long story short, I ended up, you know, just being able to put my best foot forward each and every day and uh, just just try to get better. And so uh, go through the training and then I lead up into the combine where, um, you know, it's time to showcase my abilities, my skills, things like that. And so going into the combine, uh, most teams thought that, you know, I run a four, six and a 40, which was very surprising to me because, I know that personally I would never run a four six ever. And so um, whenever I got the news back, I was kind of like, okay, well, you know, whenever I, I get to the combine, you know, I'm just going to show those guys. So when I did get to the combine, I was very excited to be able to do that. And then also uh, just show them that, you know, I can also move as far as like, you know, me doing position work and things like that. So the, it seemed like the combine took forever to get here, but once the combine was over with and also the pro day was over with, it was kind of like, okay, now I can take a deep breath and I can just focus on football because at first it's kind of like, you know, I'm just training. I'm trying to learn how to start in the 40, learn how to finish a 40 and things like that versus, you know, I'm not really doing much position work and a lot of things that kind of lead into, you know, playing football. And so once those things was over, I was able to take a deep breath and really just, you know, look back and, you know, I'll be grateful that I can really like just focus on football now. And so I would say from pro day up until now, it's felt like forever. Like it's only been like two months or not even like a month and a half. And it seems like it's been like half the year already. And so that part, I mean, this part right here, it's been, you know, really slow, but I guess just because I'm anxious and yeah. Yeah, man. Delarian Turner yell is the guest here on the OU insider under the visor podcast. And man, uh, for those that are unfamiliar would you go ahead and kind of take us through what the day-to-day -day life of an athlete preparing for the NFL draft is? When you get up in the morning, what does your day look like? Right. So me personally, um, I woke up at 6 a.m. every day. Well, I didn't wake up at 6 a.m. I woke up around like 5.30ish, um, had to be at the, the workout facility at 6 o'clock, and I lived like 15 minutes away. And so, you know, I had to get up early for that. Um, so as soon as I get to the facility, uh, they, they had breakfast there for us every morning. And so the breakfast was like 30 minutes long. And so um, by the time it's, it's like 6.30, 6.45-ish, and uh, we head to medical. So we had medical 
we had like two different medical um things that we did. One was like either you'll get a massage at like seven in the morning or you know, if something was wrong with you, you'll go to physical therapy and things like that. You also, you know, go to the to the Cairo, uh, you'll go see him if if you know if need be. Um and so those two sessions were they they totaled up to an hour. And then after that, we would go um to the field. You know, some days would be position work, a little position work, but and then the other days would be, you know, 40 work and uh five, 10, five, short shoulder, things like that. And so we were out there for like two hours, an hour and a half, two hours. Then we would go back. We would go back to more medical. Um, most of that after the field would just be like recovery because, you know, we've ran, things like that. And so it would be like a lot of leg drainage or really these. this is the time where the massages came into play. And so um, after, after, the, after we did medical, then we ate. And then after we ate, we watched film over the things that we did at the field that day, um, just to be able to correct our technique. Um, if anything, if it was anything that we were struggling with, just being able to correct that and see like what what to do and what not to do. And then after that, um, the the film led up right into the lift. So the the film lasted for like another hour to uh, uh, hour hour thirty. And then after that, we had like fifteen minutes to get ready for the lift. Um, depending on what was on schedule for the lift, um, the lift would. I would say probably another hour on top of that. Um, we, we we would do the lift and then after the lift, you know, you would get your your um your shake after the lift and then you would get your food and then you know you're able to go home after that. So I woke up at like I said, 5 30 every day, and then I was back home around three o'clock, three thirty-ish. So yeah, it was it was kind of like a busy day, but it was kind of like everything was kind of like rapid fire back to back to back. So it was kind of like you never really got the chance to rest. So once you did get a chance to rest, it was kind of like I'm not going anywhere. And I trained in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where there's a lot to do. You know, Miami is only 30 minutes away, and I literally did nothing. I literally went to the workout, went right back to to my room. So I got you, man. And obviously, a big part of the pre-draft process is meeting with potential suitors, all the teams that. Uh, have studied you, have watched your game film, mm -hmm. have tracked your po progress throughout your collegiate co career and are interested in bringing you in to play for their organization uh, come the end of the month when the NFL draft takes place. Now, uh, obviously, there's a degree of confidentiality that you got to maintain with the teams you're meeting with. So uh, not necessarily asking you to go into great detail here, uh, but just kind of give us an idea of what the nature of those meetings are and how frequent those are throughout the pre-draft process for a guy like you. Right. Um, so with, before I would say before the combine, you know, I really didn't have um, that much conversation with teams. But um, once I exceeded the numbers that they thought, you know, that I was going to give them at the combine, uh, conversations really ramped up a lot. Um, it was times where I was talking to like four or five different teams like every day. And um, the conversations are kind of all the same. They're all repetitive. Um, majority of them just want to know, you know, your life, your life story, you know, how are you you, how were you brought up and a lot of them ask me you know how did how did I get to OU and then they they want to see like if you know if you've gone through some things in life so they ask you like some personal not like personal questions but they ask you you know what adversity have you faced in life and things like that and then you know they they turn on your tape you watch the good plays you watch the bad plays I mean whenever you watch the good plays you you know you're obviously feeling bad I mean feeling feeling really good about yourself and then when they come to bad plays you're like oh man so, I mean, all talks have been uh, positive at the end of the day. It's kind of like the bad plays that they pull up, they're just helping you out, you know, kind of just giving me feedback on, you know, how I could have made the play better and things like that, how I could have helped myself out within the play. Um, but all in all, like the talks have been phenomenal. Um, like I said, I'm very blessed to even be able to be on the phone or anything like that with, a, with an organization that's, you know, trying to get me to come out and play for them. And you mentioned that teams are always interested in what your journey has been to that point. So let's go ahead and rewind there for a little bit. And let's go back to the beginning for you. You came out of Hempstead, Texas as a three-star recruit. Uh, describe the process of coming to OU because uh, most people may recall uh, that you were briefly committed to Baylor. Uh, that didn't last long. You ended up at OU. And then from the get-go in 2018, uh, you were in the rotation defensively and then became uh, a three-year starter for the program. So uh, kind of from the beginning there, from high school, as your, as your recruitment starting to pick up, what really stood out to you about OU to the point where uh, you felt comfortable making that your home for four years? Right. Um, so like, so as you mentioned, you know, I was committed to Baylor, sadly. 
Um, but um, you know that that was I I I I committed to Baylor, you know, obviously because I felt like it was a fit at the time, and then it was also you know helping some personal issues that I had at the time. Um, and so once I did take the the visit to Oklahoma, it was kind of like oh. Okay, and so the coaches at Baylor, you know, they felt some type of way whenever I did visit here, and I was kind of like surprised. Like, I mean, I understand like that I'm committed to you guys, but my recruitment is still open, and so I felt the need that like I could still go out and I could take visits. I can go this place, I can go that place, and so whenever you know they did, you know, say those say like you know, come to me as if they were like upset that I took the visit. At the time, I didn't understand because I like I watched Oklahoma, but not really like I didn't really watch him as you know I didn't really watch him for real so um the coaches were mad um and so I ended up decommitting from from those guys and then you know I came to Oklahoma the next day and then once I got to Oklahoma I literally just you know fell in love with the place at the time as you know uh Lincoln Raleigh was here and I you know I just felt like you know those guys were, were family I felt like that you know they they really wanted the best for me and at the end of the day that's all I was looking for and once I did, you know, decommit from Baylor, I had to make sure that, you know, I had some, like some of my family members were were cool with that because like I said, I committed there. One, because I felt like it was home and then another because, you know, I had some personal issues going on. And, you know, once my family kind of get like, gave me the green light on it, it was kind of like, okay, well now, you know, I'm open to go anywhere. And, you know, I fell in love with this, but it's kind of like, it's kind of hard to come to Oklahoma and not commit to Oklahoma. Uh, so, if there's any advice I can give any recruit, I mean, once you come to Oklahoma, it's hard to leave here and not and not want to commit and play for this place. So um, that's that's kind of how I how I led up, how I got here. And then once I got here, it was kind of like, okay, now it's just you know time for me to believe in myself. Um, got here, and once I once I did get here, I was like third on the depth chart at the time, and I just continued to tell myself, you know, at the end of the day, you're here for a reason. Um, I really I had some rough days starting off, some rough weeks starting off, and you know as I continue to tell myself that, you know, I just continue to push myself each and every day and uh, just, just got better. And then, you know, once I, once I got better after, you know, learned from my mistakes, my freshman year, um, we get a new coaching staff the next year. And, you know, I, I'm starting uh, during spring ball leading up into the season. Um, still, still kind of learning a little bit, still trying to learn the ins and outs of, you know, college football as, as, as a, as a young bull at the time. And once I, uh, once I did learn the ropes, it was kind of like up from there. Uh, but I just had to keep learning along the way, still learning today because you can never overcome the game of football. So just be, being able to just be a student of the game really led me to where I'm at today. Now, obviously, Oklahoma right now is going through a transition after the mm -hmm. change in the coaching staff. And we'll touch on that here more in a little bit. But uh, I want to rewind again to 2018, your first year here, because Mike Stoops was the defensive coordinator for half of that mm -hmm. season. Uh, right. was fired in the aftermath of that agonizing Red River loss to Texas. Yeah. And this is something that uh, what the Oklahoma defense and offense, for that matter, is going through right now is something mm -hmm. you had to go through in 2019 or 2018 slash 2019 when you're right. trying to make the transition from the Mike Stoops scheme to the Alex Grinch scheme. So mm -hmm. what is the most challenging aspect of that and what all goes into that transitional period between one defensive coordinator's scheme and another's. Right. Um, it's kind of like, you know, when you go from one to another, uh, you kind of have like the old defensive coordinator, like all the checks and all the calls kind of ingrained in your head because you went over like multiple times. And then it's like, once the new guy comes, you have to, you have to learn all of the, the new techniques that he's teaching. You kind of have to change almost the way that, you know, you guarded someone from a defensive back standpoint, because, some coaches will want you to start your off off man coverage at seven yards versus some want you to start at 10. And so just being able to learn the differences between the two, I would say was probably like the most challenging part, but um, it's, it, it kind of goes away like after like a week or two, um, once you, you know, start to hear the, the new calls like over and over and over. But I feel like um, the guys that are there right now, or handling that transition very well um, for me being out at like spring practices and also for me talking to those guys, like, I feel like, you know, they're, they're in great hands. And at the end of the day, uh, th this, this team is going to be special for sure. Now, man, I'm hesitant to even go here because it's so far in the rear view mirror for everybody uh, that it just, it kind of seems disingenuous to a certain extent to rewind to, but I understand that this is, 
something people want to hear everybody's take on and experience with. So let's go back to November 28th, 2021. It's the day after y'all lost Bedlam to Oklahoma State, again, in agonizing fashion. And you, everybody gets the text message, right, that there's going to be a team meeting. And that's when y'all find out that Lincoln Riley is going out to USC to take the head coaching job there now mm -hmm. in the aftermath and there was a month between then and the alamo bowl victory over oregon so uh in that moment and over the next month uh what was your experience of how that all went down um well as soon, like as soon as it happened it was a lot of confusion around the building um it was kind of like everyone was just like caught by surprise like no one you know saw it coming Obviously, we saw the news that, you know, we kept hearing rumors about the LSU and whatnot. But then, you know, once he made it clear that he wasn't going to LSU, we're, you know, we're kind of like, okay, well, he isn't going anywhere. And then, like you say, the next day, uh, the news breaks and everyone is kind of like shocked and confused. And it's, it, at the time, it seemed like everyone was like all over the place. Um, but one guy that I do, you know, want to really thank a lot was Bob Stoops because he didn't have to come in and he didn't have to, you know, help us out the way he did. But I really applaud him and, and have much respect for him for doing doing that, really stepping in and, you know, helping us out in the dark time. Um, he really was there with us through it all. Uh, he didn't turn his back anytime we needed a question or anytime we had a question or needed something from him, you know, he, he always delivered. And that just speaks to, you know, why, why he's so legendary. But I would say um, everyone was, was confused and everyone was shocked. And it was kind of like, you know, well, we do have a game coming up and, you know, what are we going to do about it? Um, or the playbooks going to change or like what's going to happen. So like I, I would say uh, Bob Stoops you made everyone extremely comfortable around the building. Delarian Turner yell, the guest on the OU insider under the visor podcast uh, and man in the aftermath. And there was a week between Lincoln Riley's departure and the announcement that Brent Menables was going to be Oklahoma's next head coach thereafter. Mm -hmm. There were three weeks between that announcement and the bull victory over Oregon. In those three weeks, man, uh, Venables obviously was very proactive in getting to know the team, establishing uh, both his new staff and his new philosophy, the entirety of his regime. But, man, I would see the photos on social media from mm -hmm. the meetings that Coach Venables would hold. And, man, at that point, you're a senior. You've got the option to come back for an extra year if you want it. But you're coming off – a couple of seasons that by all measures were outstanding. You'd been one of the most reliable members of that defense in an overall uh, sense, not just exclusive to the secondary. But my point is leading up to that Alamo bowl, there's not a whole lot left for you to prove at the collegiate level, but mm -hmm. you're sitting in there in those meetings, notebook and pen in hand, devotedly, taking notes on every single aspect of what Brent Venables is there preaching to you. So I ask that, uh, or I, I mentioned that to kind of ask, what was it about Venables that really stood out to you and how difficult was it for you to make that decision to elect to turn pro as opposed to coming back, taking your fifth year and playing for coach Venables? Um, I would say coach Venables is different from, from 90% of the country. Um, he might be, it might even be 95% of the country just because, you know, he's a guy that's extremely off of faith. And I feel like uh, that's where, you know, that's what we have in common. Um, I'm definitely a guy off of faith. And the first thing that he talked about when he came in was just having faith. And he talked about um, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that kind of caught me by surprise because you don't hear much talk about certain things like that from a head coach. And whenever he, you know, he was talking, it was kind of like, man, you could tell the difference between a coach um, a young coach and a, a coach that's been in it for for a minute, and that was the, that was that was the most intriguing thing um, that he just came in. And he was you know speaking about faith and just being able to to make sure that he made the right decision with coming to OU. And one thing that he said that you know he's going to make sure that this is the right the right decision for him. He's going to give it all he has. I mean, some guys you know just say it, just say it, but some guys actually live live up to that expectation and I feel like for me being on the outside looking in now and for me hearing um guys talk like he's definitely living up to that expectation um not that you know Lincoln Riley anybody from that past staff took this place for granted but you I can definitely tell that um because Venables is putting his all 
lean to it. Um, and it was kind of it was kind of funny because he almost he almost got me back. He almost got me back for the fifth year. And uh, I'm talking about him, you know, speaking on faith. That kind of helped me out along the way because, like you said, I feel like I had a pretty good year um, this past season. And it was kind of like nothing else for me to do. And at the end of the day, it was either, you know, I was going to come back to to play another season or I was going to step on on faith and I was going to um, prepare for the next level. And so with me hearing that his speeches and him, you know, talk about him having faith and things like that really just helped me out along the way and kind of helped me finalize my decision on whether, you know, I should leave or I should come back. Now, you've mentioned that you've been around the team a little bit this mm -hmm. spring as you've been preparing for the draft. You've had the opportunity to attend some of those practices, interact with your ex-teammates, interact with the new coaching staff. What really stands out about the new vision, the new mood, the new philosophy in Norman, Oklahoma? Um, I just feel like everyone around the building is appreciated, um, no matter you know where you stand in the program, whether you're a walk-on or whether you know you've been here for five years, um, everyone is is on the on the evil playing field when it comes to treatment and fairness around the building. Um, it's just like everyone is is well respected, you know, from the coaches all the way down. Um, the players respect the coaches, coaches respect the players, and it's just like everyone around the building is different. Like I just being honest, last year or the past few years, like it will be times where we really harp on like the locker room being clean over and over and over again. And it's like, now I walk in there and these guys are like finished with spring practice. And I know how, how the locker room used to look after spring practice when I was there and after practice in general. And it's just like, versus now you're going in, it's like nothing on the floor. And it's kind of like everyone is just being held accountable in the right way. And it's, it's like, no, no, no one can slack off no matter, you know, if you're a coach or if you're a player, everyone, Every, like obviously Coach Venables is the head man. Everyone listens to him. Everyone follows his order, but he doesn't um, disrespect anyone like in a, in a huge fashion. At the end of the day, he he always explains to them. He's always he's just only there to help them and to like help everyone as a whole. Now, I don't know how much of an opportunity you'll get to watch or track the spring game this Saturday. Uh, as you go through your pre-draft uh, workout regimen and the whole process in which, as you mentioned earlier, uh, everything is very, uh, very organized and you have a schedule that you're adhering to every single day. So uh, with that in mind, uh, even if you don't get the opportunity to sit down and take it all in on Saturday, uh, what has you most confident about the future of Oklahoma football and where do you think this team can go in 2022? Right. Um, for me, seeing these guys early on, um, obviously, you know, offense, offense and defense, both, you know, still getting acquainted with the playbooks that they're that they're being given. Um, but me seeing those guys execute at such a high level, and how early it is, how how new everything is to those guys, really, really gives me a lot of uh, hope in these guys. Like I feel like these guys can can still be, you know, in that in that college football playoff, potentially playing for a national championship this upcoming season. Um, yes, I do understand that it's the first season under Coach Venables, and this is not a biased opinion. I'm I'm being as honest as I can be. Um, when I look at these guys, kind of like, dang, like it's only spring ball, and everyone is already doing this, everyone is already doing that. And just from last year up until now, I've already seen a few guys take like a tremendous jump. I'm seeing like different players, like I'm seeing I'm seeing the same guys from last year do different things than they were doing last year. So it's kind of like you know the guys are having appreciation for it having an advanced and elite coaching staff and being able to just go out there and execute and being able to um, do the things they need to do. And so it's kind of like you're seeing like the younger guys mature. Um, I'm talking about from like a freshman going to a sophomore. In college, the sophomore is still kind of young, but I'm seeing some some sophomores really, really, really um, play, play, play some mature football out there. So I, I have high hopes and high standards for this team, and I feel like they'll do great this upcoming season. And, yes, I, I will be at the spring game, so I'll be able to track everything that um, oh you're gonna be there guys gonna, yeah I'm, I'm actually gonna, I'm in Norman right now so yeah I'm actually gonna be there I'm actually gonna be at the spring game so I'm looking forward to it um if you had the question if you're gonna ask me you know who I think is gonna win um for me seeing the rosters I'm seeing a lot of I'm seeing a lot of talent on the white side but I'm gonna go with the underdogs I'm gonna go with the red squad just see what they what those guys can do Wow. There you go. Okay. DTY says the red team has the advantage on Saturday. Uh, it's Oklahoma safety. Delarian Turner yell. 
uh, been very gracious with his time here and uh, it, with and being willing to join us here on the OU Insider Under the Visor podcast. And man, I just got a couple more questions for you. One being, uh, you are one of twelve Sooners that are draft eligible in this class. Mm-hmm. Uh, how much have you gotten the chance to interact with your peers, the guys you went to war alongside for four years, the likes of Nick Benito, Brian Asamoah, uh, Laron Stokes, all those guys that like you are taking that leap of faith and putting themselves out there uh, as NFL draft uh, candidates. How much mm-hmm. have you gotten the chance to interact with them and share the entirety of this process alongside them? Um, so Nick Benito, uh, Nick, uh, uh, Nick Benito, uh, Brian, uh, Perion, Laron, IT, um, we, we're all in a, a group chat and it's kind of like, you know, we almost talk every day. And so, um, we, we kind of have to remind each other sometimes that like, like, like we're, we're really blessed. And for example, I'm, I'm talking to, uh, BA and, and Nick Benito earlier today uh right before we worked out and you know we 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 meet with the same teams and you know they install like a play for us and you know we're talking over it today you know and and brian was like man it's kind of crazy like we're actually you know sitting here having a conversation about like uh, nfl defense and we we kind of have to remind each other like at the end of the day it's all a blessing and it kind of like we kind of like have a respect for each other um because, you know, we actually went to war with each other. We've seen each other good days. We've seen each other bad days. And for us to be now having conversations as such really, really, um, really, really, like, makes us excited. Like, you know, everyone is ready to go. Everyone is pumped. And so I I feel that, you know, everyone everyone that gets drafted or whatever, wherever we land, uh, we're going to make a huge impact in the NFL. Now, man, as you think back on your time at Oklahoma – uh, what are some of the memories that stand out, whether if it, whether it's a game, whether it's a play, whether it's a relationship? What do you think are the things that you're most going to carry with you uh, as you close this chapter of your life at Oklahoma and look ahead to the NFL and beyond? But what really stands out in your mind when you think back to the four years that you had in Norman? Right. Um, I'm, I'm definitely going relationships, number one, uh, just for the simple fact, like I just said. Um, not only the guys in the draft class, but also the guys that are still here. And it's just like, you know, we've, we've been going to war with each other for the last three to four years. And so it's just like with us leaving that at the end of the day, we had a brotherhood here. Um, you know, we, we came in, you know, we, we started to trust each other. We start to gain that love for each other. And so with us doing that and still talking to this day, um, really, really just, it just speaks volume. So I'm definitely, I'm definitely taking that relationships with me wherever I go. Um, so I'll definitely still be in contact with, with everyone. I'm not that type of guy that'll make it big and then, you know, turn his phone off or change his number or something like that. I'm definitely going to still be in contact with the guys. Uh, I still have love for, for all those guys, you know, that I went to work with that's still here. And also the guys that, that are going to the draft. So the guys that are in the draft, um, hopefully, you know, I'm on a team with one of the guys, so that, you know, we can still, you know, have their relationship. But uh, even the guys that are here, I'm still going to, you know, stay in contact, come back to support anytime I can. Uh, I, was, I was actually talking to Justin Broz and Billy Bowman earlier today, and I'm like, you know, just let me, let me know whenever you guys' uh, jersey starts to go on sale so, you know, I can purchase it. And whenever, you know, I'm walking up to my game the next day after you guys' game, you know, I can have one of them on. And, you know, they kind of like laughed and joked about that. But, nah, I would take the uh, relationships with me for sure. And then uh, as far as like games, man, the games has been a lot of a lot of games that that I'll remember forever here. Um, I'll, I'll probably say both both Baylor games in 2019, the comeback, and also the Big 12 championship game. Um, the Flo- the Florida game sticks out to me a lot just because I feel like we ended the season the right way um, back in 2020 uh, with dealing with COVID and everyone, you know, some guys out this week, some you know, so. With us going through all of that and still at the end of the day being able to stick together and, you know, play a phenomenal Florida Gator team and, you know, beat them the way we beat them really, really speaks a lot about us. So that game sticks out to me. Um, the, the Nebraska game this past season, all in all of the the, text, the Red River uh, shootout games, even the game that we lost, you know, at the end of the day, we just have to respect the history of the game. Um, and there's a lot of greats that have, that have come uh, before us to play in that game. So, those games will always be special. And any time that, you know, I could get back to one of those games, I'm definitely going to do that as well. All right. What was the best play you ever made as a Sooner? 
Mm. Knee jerk reaction. Uh, I, I'll, probably, I'll probably say the play against uh, Iowa State this past season, the fourth and one Brock Purdy. I, I, I like that play a lot. I do like that play a lot. Just the way, um, how the play was set up, where I came from, and you know, just being able to make a, a big play for my team. There were a, there were a lot of highlight real plays that game. Uh, <laughs> from the hit you made on that fourth and one to Perry on just burying Brock Purdy there uh, on the on the near hash, uh, and that was senior day for you as yeah. well. So yeah. uh, another another memorable undertone uh, to that experience. We are scarce more than twenty four hours away from the spring game at Owen Field, and less than a week away from the beginning of the NFL draft. We will have full coverage of both at OUinsider.com. That is Delarian Turner Yale. Trey, again, very much appreciate your time and being willing to jump on with us here. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. That does it for this installment of the OU Insider Under the Visor podcast. Stay tuned for our post-game podcast after the spring game Saturday. We'll see you next time, Sooner fans.